Hi, I'm Michael Marin. At Holy Name Medical Center, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on earth. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. Cohn Resnick, accounting, tax, and advisory, where forward thinking creates results. Fedway Associates, the Fidelco Group, and by New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce you. For the first, it's the first time my here. first time WNET. here. I know. I go by it all the time. I, I'm glad I finally stopped in. Let me formally introduce you, Heather Thompson, yes. who is the founder and CCO. CCO, Chief C Creative C -C Officer. CCO. What does that stand for? Chief Creative Officer. I love that. Yes. Of uh, Yummy by Heather Thompson. Also, you may recognize Heather. Uh, my wife and I were just watching you the other night on The Real Housewives of New York City. Uh, we had that Andy Cohen here yes. not too long ago. He's a troublemaker, isn't he? <laughs> I say he's the biggest drama queen of all of us. He is. <laughs> he is. He loves it. He is in the right job, and he's really good at it. Now, first of all, tell us about your business, and then we'll... Sure. Travel sure. back to the other thing. Sure. So Yummy by Heather Thompson, my brand, was founded by me um, as a selfish initiative, really. It was, um, like a lot of moms, I was faced with true weight loss after childbirth. And so I went to the shapewear department to boost my confidence. And when I got there, I was like aghast by my choices. I was like, these are literally my grandmother's girdles, you know. But I scarfed a bunch up any, any way to, you know, boost my confidence. And my husband caught me putting one on. He caught you. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, what the heck is this? that and I was like get out I'm terrible and ugly and so it was like with the tears streaming down my face I, I took off my consumer hat and I put on my designer hat and I leaned back on which is your background that's my background over 20 years of design experience and I created this tank top which was a three panel idea so it was cotton at the top it had shaping fabric in the middle and then cotton again at the bottom I hold, hold 12 patents on that idea today so a good idea is the mother of all invention right ne necessity um, is the mother of all invention and that's how I started of the brand so it was with one one tank top but now yummy by heather thompson is really all about essentials it's about confidence for women so it's it's shape it's bras and panties intimate apparel hosiery leggings it's denim it is active apparel and it's loungewear which is our newest launch and it's about kind of you know helping out our active lifestyles as women you work out all the time i work out all the time but i work out on the streets of new york all the time too and within other cities i'm running from a to b all the time and i need clothing that's going to be versatile that's going to work with me versus against me. And, and I mean that in all, all, all ways. Mm. Like, you know, you get dressed in the morning, and if your bra's not fitting right, you start with a lump. If your panties not fitting right, you start with a bump. And, yeah, yummy shapewear can smooth all that away, but it's all about clothing that's going to fit you well and fit into your lifestyle and make you feel confident. Growing up, where was that? I grew up in New York, but upstate New York, about two hours north of the city in the Hudson Valley. And design became your... Yes. Obsession, a healthy obsession, professionally yes. when? Well, it started when I was a little girl, but I didn't recognize it. So I was the kid who got through college and then was like, what am I going to do? I didn't, you know, and I had a really smart mom who said to me, just because you graduated from four years of college doesn't mean that your life plan rolls out in front of you. Go to what you love. Go toward what you love, mm. and you'll figure it out. And what I loved at that time was skiing. And so, skiing. yeah, I'm a big skier. I, I was a ski instructor throughout college to help. Hold support. on, wait a minute. Yep. <laughs> All right, now I remember. <laughs> it's terrible that I only know you from the series because now I'm thinking skiing. There yeah. was a ski thing 
It was you who got them. You ski, you ski well. I ski well, yes. So. And you made sure the other ones knew how well you ski <laughs> and that they don't. I'm the athlete, right? You're a real athlete. <laughs> I am a true athlete. You and I really, I really like, I'm competitive, you know, athletically so and by nature. <laughs> I, I admit it fully. I own it. And not embarrassed at and all. Not you be. Yeah, I want to finish first. So, um... So it was through skiing that I got into my love of skiing, turned into my love of ski apparel, and I thought I wanted to design ski clothes. So it was after college I got a job um, in the fashion industry. My mom said, well, before you go back to school for it, why don't you get involved in the industry and see if it's something that you really want to do. So I got my first job in fashion, and I never looked back. And I learned on the cutting room floors in factories wow. across the world. And here I am today with my own brand. Well, you know, it's so interesting because Tell me with your background, your business background, your fashion background. You're an entrepreneur. Yes. You've, you've built a team. You're part of the Yummy team is here. Yes. Right, in the studio. I will tell you, it fascinates me that someone with your success, in all candor, would put it out there yeah. on a reality show like this. Because I'm thinking, she's got it going on, and what is she doing in these ridiculous arguments what? Help me. You gotta, you, don't tell me you haven't thought the same thing no. yourself. No, oh, please. I think it every time I watch an episode. You, do you say to yourself, is that me? Yeah, I do. I do. So, you know, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. You know, so it's twofold. So first and foremost, when I was offered the opportunity, when, you know, Bravo came to me and said, would you be interested in, in being a housewife? My first reaction was n no. I, 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 me? No. But then my marketing brain kicked in and I had started a new business, you know. Yummy is only three years old when, you know, I got on, on the Housewives when I was offered the position. Sure. And so I thought to myself, you know, brand awareness, opportunity. you know, opportunity. I also have not a, to mention with your son how helpful it's a been. Little Talk boy about Jax, with, right? Yes. And it really is not even helpful for well, it's therapeutic for Jax. Talk about that. I don't want to assume everyone. Yeah, so I, I'm Jack, too so inside here. I'm sorry. My little kid, I love I don't want to assume everyone on public television watches <laughs> I'm glad Bravo and the real me Even though Andy's through. a friend, I just wanna go ahead. Yes. So um, my husband and I had a little boy um, who was born with um, some complica complications. And what started with some lung complications, which continued to this day, um, also turned into liver complications. And at six months old, he had a liver transplant. So he has a transplanted organ. And you know, a donor saved his life. And so I, for Donald Blair, who was Jax's donor, um, I got involved in advocating for organ donation and what a platform the Housewives provided me to do that. Also as a mom of a sick little boy, you know, people could, who wanted to check out of their own lives, which they do for what I call our modern day soap opera, which is the Housewives. It is. Um, turn on the TV to check out of their own life and all of a sudden there's someone there that's like, oh my God. Uh, that they could relate to, and they didn't feel alone. Because I remember, even though my husband was right there at my side, and we had doctors at my side, as the mommy, I felt really alone. Like, I felt like nobody really felt like how I felt going through it. So if I could make another woman or father feel not alone, that, that was such a huge opportunity for us. And so we advocate for the things that are important to us as a family on the show also. And your profile's been raised, and so you can raise awareness. You can raise more 100%. money and get people to care That's that right. possibly that's may right. not have cared otherwise. That's right. I got involved with a charity called No Barriers. Um, and it was No part of, Barriers. No Barriers. And okay. my tagline is, what's within me is stronger than what's in my way. It gets cut down a little bit, so it's like, I'm stronger than what's in my way. But it, it, I, That would have been, I'm sorry, yeah. that would have been better yeah. than... Holler. Holler. Well, holler's at the end all the time. <laughs> you, you love it or hate it, but it's a positive shout out saying, I'm stronger than what's in my way. Holla, like shout that out. I love it. Yeah. You know what, I, the other thing I love about you is you apologize for nothing. It's like, it is what it is and that's yes. it. Yes, but, and when I need to apologize, I'm the first one to do it. You know what's interesting it's though? so easy to do. And by the way, I've often thought that even people say that's not real and I say, nah. Right. No, think about the things that happen in our mm -hmm. lives, the ridiculous mm -hmm. arguments mm -hmm. we get into. And I've also often noticed when people in public television, we, we're not better than anyone. We just try to have more meaningful dis discourse. Right. Elevated discourse. <laughs> Agreed. Not like with our nose too. up. We don't no. do it that way. No. I but I'll say like this. I'm curious and fascinated by who apologizes, who doesn't, yeah. why they do, why they mm -hmm. don't, because mm -hmm. I think that's very 
real. Yeah, I think it's very real, too. I, I, I know it's real. So the arguments are always real. This is not a scripted show that we're on whatsoever, but it is a show built for entertainment. So what they find is the quirky sides of what's going on, and they exploit that. And that, So you have to have thick skin. You have to have a sense of humor, mm. be able to laugh at yourself. But what a unique opportunity to be able to look at yourself on TV acting as yourself. You know, communications 101, right, is how we perceive ourselves and how others perceive us. So, you know, it's it was really, you know, I had to look at it objectively and say, hey, do I like that about myself? And are there things that I can change about myself? Have you done that? Yes, for sure. So, so without getting too, too inside. Yeah. So with Bethany Frankel, who a lot of people know because her, I think her talk show is on for a... Two seasons, I think. I think we said two weeks. Um, it <laughs> was on for a period of time. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. I wish her nothing but the best. Yes. And she's been incredibly successful as mm -hmm. a business person. And for the, if you don't know, there's been a lot of this between yeah. you and her, at least the, when we watched the show, right. which, which is a few months mm -hmm. ago, showing now. I'm sitting there going, these two very strong professional women who've accomplished a great deal, they should be able to get along. Yes. They should have a good relationship, mm -hmm. but they don't on the show. And I'm thinking to myself, did Andy and his team set that up so that this goes that way? Or is that just two people who just don't get along? What is that? Well, you who know, should? I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest with you. Again, like I said, it's a TV show built for entertainment. So what we film in a two-hour window gets smushed into, you know, a three-minute episode, you know, three-minute segment of an episode that's, you know, a lot less than four hours, you know, and that could be one scene that we shoot that mm. much. So they condense it, you know. So every argument Bethany and I have, every little quip we make at each other may get condensed down. And at the beginning, I'll be honest with you, um, I didn't, I didn't go. I when I joined the show first and foremost, I went in with open arms, open mind, open mm. heart. I didn't judge anybody for what I had seen on the show. You know what I mean? And I don't judge people. I say live and let live. But I had a feeling that Bethany and I wouldn't get along. Really? Yeah, I did. I, I thought that we wouldn't really hit it off because she's she's very quick and very, you know what I mean? And I'm a, I'm a really quick thinker too, but it's a part of my personality to, that I have, I have reeled in. You know, I, in my 20s, I would finish other people's sentences. You know what I mean? I would do those things. And as a, as a owner of my own company where I have, you know, 47 employees and being a director for people like Puffy and Jennifer Lopez and Beyonce and, you know, being representing them, you know, I wanted to be a good manager. And so I had to take a look at myself and say, how, how are you going to be a good manager? Well, you've got to take your, your features and understand that there's flaw to those features, too. So being a quick thinker is great, but it can also be a negative. I think you just answered the question I was going to ask you. The greatest leadership lesson that you have learned in your professional and personal life is? How to manage others and how to bring leaders out of your team. So building other leaders, I think, is, my, was, is what I've learned along the way and what I'm most proud of. Seeing people that have worked for me, worked under me, go on to do really great things, that's like my biggest pride. Like, it's I not enough that. that you're the one. No, it's about everybody else. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not good at patting myself on the back, and you know I do believe that if you're doing a good job, it should be known, and if you're doing a bad job, it should be known, so you have a chance to redeem yourself. I don't do that to myself so much, but I definitely, you know, teach that to others. One more time about your son, Jax. Yes. The cause again. Um, the Kellner Pediatric Liver Foundation, uh, Donate Life America. Um, the Kellner Pediatric Liver Foundation is uh, a charity I, uh, that I founded with my girlfriend Samantha Kellner and her husband, and we support little guys and girls who need liver transplants. And your company again is Yummy by Heather Thompson. And Heather, I want to thank you for joining us, and and for those who think they know you <laughs> from Bravo, this is the public television. Side. Yes. Yes. You're very complex. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for joining us. We Thanks appreciate for it. having me. I yeah. loved it. One on one, we'll be right back from the heart of uh, Manhattan Lincoln Center right after this. Stay with us. Thank you. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. That's a great uh, band, Tiempo Libre. Thank you. And uh, you're looking at Jorge Gomez, the founder and musical director of Temp Tiempo Libre, and uh, their new CD is called Panamericano. You're right. Now, you have a great story, a wonderful story. Grew up where? Uh, Havana, Cuba. Yeah, left there when? In 95, I went to live in Guatemala for five years, and then, and then to Miami. And then to Miami, what year? Uh, 2000. This group? is amazing. Why? 
because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we could ha have been through many hard things in Cuba, living in different countries, and then we reunite again in Miami with the idea to play our music, to play our culture, mm. to be the same way that we are used to be in Cuba. You know, you say the same way we used to be in Cuba. For those of us who only read <laughs> and watched uh -huh. video or, or heard things about Fidel Castro that we thought we understood, or my colleague, my, my great co-anchor, mm -hmm. Rafael Piorman, who wishes he was doing this interview right now, family from Cuba, mm -hmm. um, what was real? The thing that you watch is only the 10%. Mm. 90%, uh, you have to be there. You have to... What would we see? <laughs> what would we have seen? Well, you're gonna see fantastic people trying to survive for the mm. system, trying to get food for the family, and of course, play music every day, dancing every day, trying to forget the way that they live. Trying to forget? Yes, it's very hard to live in Cuba because Cuba is all about the government, and the government not always have the, the right thing to... Not supportive of music? Music is not important for the government. <laughs> it's important for the people. How, I'm curious about this. You say there was not important to the government, but you're always making music. Yeah, because Cuba is not the government. Cuba came before Castro, before so many. Before Batista. Yeah, yeah. Cuba have been Cuban since Cristobal Colón discovered that island. You know, your influences mu musically. Who were they? United States all the time. Who? Uh, Erwin Empire, Cool and the Gang, Chaka Khan, really? Korea, Kenny Killen, yeah. That was illegally to hear American music Illegal. at the time. Illegal, yes. If they catch you, put that music, you're gonna be in jail. What? Yeah. That happened in my in my time in Cuba, that was illegal. You listen to Earth, Wind and Fire, you're yes. yeah. going to jail. Exactly. <laughs> because it's American music, it's the enemy music. At that time, right now, yes. it changed our being. Yeah. So what's it like for you to be in Miami with your very close friends and colleagues performing this beautiful music? A lot of people say that it's a dream come true. For me, it's my life. So, uh... Meaning you're supposed to be doing this? <laughs> Are we supposed to be doing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I supposed to be here a long time before that I get here. Uh, How did you get here? I came from Guatemala here. I have a Spain passport, so that was very easy for me. But I'm sure Paul Wine, the person that can have that possibility to come to the United States. A lot of my friends, my compatriotas, came in rough, you see. Yes. And it's very difficult. Is their family still in Cuba? No. No, no family left? They're intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> I have family living in Canada, Spain, United States. What does it mean to you that um, there's a lot of talk right now about, uh, they say, normalizing mm -hmm. relationships, the relationship between U.S. and Cuba, and the president mm -hmm. um, is talking about that, and that uh, uh, Raul uh, Castro is there, and that he's not his brother, and you say... Mm. <laughs> Well, it's a good point. And for sure, it's going to be very good for Cuban people. I don't know how the government is going to handle that situation because yeah. um, they always want to have the control. Yeah. And right now, um, I don't know. Yeah. Since you didn't come here to talk politics, you came here to talk music, describe <laughs> Panamericano. Describe the Pan music on this CD. That's our life in Miami Beach. Miami Beach is a cosmopolitan city like New York. You, you, you walk from your house to the beach. It's like five, five steps. In those five steps, you're going to meet people from Argentina, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico. Everybody is in those five steps. But not only people, restaurant, culture, parties, everything. So we try to put all together in an album. How do you, do, how do you appeal to all those different people, musically? Because it, it describes it as, as, this is an interesting description, if you have to describe your music, uh, as Afro-Caribbean music. Yeah, exactly. But it's more than that. Of course. We have uh, 
the Cuban rhythms like cha cha cha, wawanko, uh, conga, bolero, timba, salsa. But at the same time, the lyrics for the album are story, storytelling by them, by my friend. We have a lot of guests in the album. People from Dominican Republic, mm. like Junel Cruz, from Puerto Rico, Jan, Jan Rodriguez, from Mexico, uh, Frankie J, so many names. Uh, the culture, the story are different, but the music is the same. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about uh, you're a leader of the group. Mm -hmm. Is that a good description? Yes, yes. What's the most interesting thing about being the leader of this group? Uh, well, most challenging. Keep everybody together. <laughs> <laughs> a huge challenge, but at the same time, see that, uh, that they are happy with a job. When I say, well, right now we're going to play in Beijing, China. Are you with me? Yeah, of course. <laughs> are you expecting the same like me? Yeah, of course. What I'm expecting, I don't know. That's exactly the answer of the question. Nothing. You got to keep them happy. Yeah. Uh, why? Because I believe in them, they believe in me, and yeah. we all believe in this project. That's wonderful. Um, Jorge Gomez, the founder and musical director of Tiempo Libre, and the CD is called Panamer Panamericano. And I want to thank you for joining us and thank you so wish much. you and your group nothing but the best. Can we, uh, as we go out to this break, listen to a little bit more of this uh, music video from this great group? Thank you so much. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to be uh, joined by Richard Gere, um, the star of this movie. Not just, that's ridiculous to even call you that. Um, um, your colleague, Orrin, was saying it took a lot of years to put this together. What did it take? Uh, well, I had to figure out how to do it. I actually, this script came to me, a version of the script, not this script, because Oren wrote a totally brand new script, but uh, there was something in a script that came to me about 12 years ago, and it just stuck with me, and I kept coming back to it and coming back to it, and finally I said, look, I'm, uh, they allowed me to buy that from people who had it, and I said, like, I can't figure out yet what to do with this, but I, I have to do it. And um, Because? It just, well, first of all, I'd been involved with the, the Coalition for the Homeless in New York for a long time. And it, and it uh, but aside from that, it just seemed like a, a movie, if I could find where the core of it was. And it was something, something about this character that was latent in the script that, that I had optioned and bought. There was relationships in it that were all powerful and, and hadn't emerged yet. It was, it was like a stone where you, you're, you're trying to, cut a figure out of the stone and it's not emerging yet but it's in there and uh, so I started chipping away at this and and I read a book by a homeless guy named Cadillac Man it was called um, uh, the land of lost souls and this is maybe five years ago got a lot of attention with the New Yorker and New York Times and, and uh, I read this book and I said well that that's the movie it's it's a neorealist film basically where it's it's not a um, it's not sentimental, it's not editorializing, it's basically telling what happened. And it's up to me and, and Oren to fill in, you know, in the center of it somehow, that there's a human being in there. And over two hours, I think you get a sense of what it would be like. It's immersive that way, to be on the streets. And for you, not being recognized by so many, which was a key to this yeah, movie, what was it like? The design of it, it was bizarre. Well, we, we kind of made that decision early on First of all, we had no money, so we were shooting. We had 21 days to shoot. Um, we had a lot of prep time, so we, we worked on a script. We were very careful about what we were, we were doing in the storytelling. But it was a brand new kind of storytelling. Uh, you've seen the film, so you know. It's just it's not like a TV movie. Um, it, it was a little scary when I went out there the first time because we had totally hidden the, the footprint of the movie makers. The, the cameras were on roofs or in storefronts or under uh, men at work tents or anything to, to hide. So it was basically, I was out there and we had very long lenses. I was in character, I had the clothes on of the character. Um, no one paid any attention. It was the most 
one of the most bizarre, profound experiences of my life, of being, as we keep talking about, it's not being invisible, it's being a black hole. It's like people afraid of being sucked into a black hole. Well, it's an important film, and we're so glad you're here at the Montclair Film Festival, and that's why this place is packed, and you well, honor us by being... You know, I didn't know this place, and, and uh, they came to us and asked, and I said, well, you know, I want to show this film everywhere I possibly can, because everyone has this problem. Uh, but, as you know, the movie isn't just about that. It's about a very private, very delicate yearning for place that we all have. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by NJIT, United Water, Holy Name Medical Center, Cone Resnick, Fedway Associates, the Fidelco Group, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. My name is Dr. John Rundbeck. I'm actually the medical director of the Interventional Institute here at Holy Name Medical Center. But peripheral arterial disease actually is extremely common. It's one of the forms of hardening of the artery. As interventional radiologists, we perform minimally invasive image-guided procedures. Generally, the procedures we do are alternatives to what would otherwise be major surgery. Almost 80% of those patients can avoid amputation if they're referred for us for these sort of procedures. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. 1-877-HOLY-NAME. Healing begins here.